Hi, I'm Urs Hölzle, and I'm responsible for the cloud and infrastructure teams at Google. Welcome to Cloud Platform Live. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today, but I'm currently in Dublin at the Web Summit, a gathering of over 10,000 developers from thousands of startups across the globe. And I'm here because we're committed to providing developers everywhere access to Google's world-class infrastructure. And my colleagues are there with you for the same reason. We want to help you build great applications and take advantage of the continuous innovation that's happening at Google. Now, I've been at Google for over 15 years, and during this time, we've pioneered warehouse scale computing. We started with a few servers in Ecola, but now we operate some of the largest data centers in the world. And most recently, we broke ground on a new facility in the Netherlands. It's our fourth hyper-efficient data center in Europe, and it will use 50% less energy than a typical data center. And together with our other facilities, allows us to provide high performance services to people around the world. Now, for security reasons, we can't really offer tours of our data centers. But we made an exception for you today. So we're going to show you an inside look at our facilities and the people who keep them running. In fact, you're the first people in the world to see this video. A data center is the brains of the internet, the engine of the internet. It is a giant building with a lot of power, a lot of cooling, and a lot of computers. It's row upon row upon row of machines, all working together to provide the services that make Google function. I love building and operating data centers. I'm Joe Cava, Vice President of Data Centers at Google. I'm responsible for managing the teams globally that design, build, and operate Google's data centers. We're also responsible for the environmental health and safety, sustainability, and carbon offsets for our data centers. This data center here in, in South Carolina is one node in a larger network of data centers all over the world. Of all the employees at Google, a very, very small percentage of those employees are authorized to even enter a data center campus. The men and women that run these data centers and keep them up 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they are incredibly passionate about what they're doing. In layman's terms, what do I do here? I typically refer to myself as the herder of cats. And I'm an engineer, hardware site operations manager. We keep the lights on and we enjoy doing it and they work very hard. So we like to provide them a fun environment where they can also play hard as well. We just went past the three million man hour mark for zero loss time incidents. Three million man hours is a really long time and with the number of people that we have on site, that is an amazing accomplishment. I think the Google data centers really can offer a level of security that almost no other company can match. We have a information security team that is truly second to none. You, you have the expression, they wrote the book on that. Well, there are many of our information security team members that have really written the books on best practices in information security. Protecting the security and the privacy of our users' information is our foremost design criteria. We use various layers of higher level security the closer into the center of the campus you get. So just to enter this campus, my badge had to be on a pre-authorized access list. Then to come into the building, that was another level of security. To get into the secure corridor, which leads to the data center, that's a higher level of security. And the data center and the networking rooms are the highest level of security. And the technologies we use are different. Like for instance, in our highest level areas, we even use underfloor intrusion detection via laser beams. So I'm going to demonstrate going into the secure corridor now. One, I have to be on the authorized list with my badge. And then two, I use a biometric iris scanner to verify that it truly is me. Okay, here we are on the data center floor. The first thing that I notice is that it's a little warm in here. It's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Google runs our data centers warmer than most because it helps with the efficiency. You'll notice that we have overhead power distribution. Coming from the outside yard, we bring in the high voltage power, distribute across the bus bars to all of the customized bus taps that are basically plugs, where we plug in all the extension cords. All of our racks don't really look like a traditional server rack. These are custom designed and built for Google so that we can optimize the servers for hyper efficiency and high performance computing. It's true that sometimes drives fail and we have to replace them to upgrade them because maybe they're just no longer efficient to run. 
we have a very thorough end-to-end -end chain of custody process for managing those drives from the time that they're checked out to the server till they're brought to an ultra-secure cage where they're erased and crushed if necessary. So any drive that can't be verified is 100% clean, we crush it first and then we take it to an industrial wood chipper where it's shredded into these little pieces like this. In the time that I've been at Google for almost six and a half years now, we have changed our cooling technologies at least five times. Most data centers have air conditioning units along the perimeter walls that force cold air under the floor that then raises up in front of the servers and cools the servers. In our solution, we take the server racks and we butt it right up against our air conditioning unit. We just use cool water flowing through those copper coils that you see there. So the hot air from the servers is contained in that hot aisle. It raises up, passes across those coils where the heat from the air transfers to the water in those coils, and then that warm water is then brought outside the data center to our cooling plant, where it is cooled down through our cooling towers and returned back to the data center, and that process just repeats over and over again. To me, the thing that amazes me about Google in the data centers is the pace of innovation and always challenging the way we're doing things. So when people say that innovation in a certain area is done, that we've kind of reached the pinnacle of what can be achieved, I just laugh. I like to think our data centers are pretty cool, but it's not just about the infrastructure itself. It's about the services on top of it and what you can do with them. So today at Cloud Platform Live, you'll learn about our latest efforts as we work to build the world's best public cloud. And I'm excited about what the team has put together for you today, and I think you will be too. So enjoy the day, and please welcome VP of Engineering, Jörg Heilig, to the stage. Thanks, Urs. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Google Cloud Platform Live. My name is Jörg Heilig. I run the engineering teams that, support, that build the developer features in Google Cloud Platform. I'm excited this morning for all of us here to come together, learn from each other, and really understand what the cloud has to offer. Here today, we're at a sold out venue in San Francisco. There are watch parties from all around the world, and there's thousands of you on the live stream, so welcome to all of you. We'd love for you to come away with a better idea of how the cloud can create opportunities for you. Our goal is to create the most innovative cloud offering possible. And you will hear later from Brian Stevens, our new VP of product, how that, what our vision is and how really that looks so that you can decide how Google fits into your cloud plans. But first, let me provide a little bit of context going back to our first Google Cloud Platform Live just six months ago. So, Let's go back to March 25th. Innovation takes many forms. There's technical innovation, and there's non-technical innovation. So when we built Google Cloud Platform, we saw that the cost of computers and hardware in our data centers was actually falling way faster than the prices in pub in public, with public cloud providers. And we thought that wasn't right. So we introduced Moore's Law pricing to the cloud slashing prices by from everywhere between 30 and 70 percent. The good news was that this was picked up by a lot of the uh, other cloud providers out there and really created a repricing in the industry that more, way more aggressively passed on these savings to you. But we didn't stop there. We thought um, we, we should go a little more, more further with, uh, with doing things automatically for you. So we introduced sustained use discounts. Uh, sustained use discounts, instead of having to think about how you're using your resources and planning ahead, which is kind of counter to what the cloud offers, the flexibility of the cloud, we figured that if you use more resources, you should get a better price, and that really is what sustained use discounts offers you. With other cloud providers, you have to uh, think about entering multi-year contracts or reserving your instances ahead of time or prepaying to get these savings. 
with us. If you just use more resources, you get the discount. Furthermore, we also introduced min per minute pricing, which is a lot more user friendly than the industry standard, like rounding up to the next hour. Since GCP Live, we have continued to create operational efficiencies driven through technology improvements and Moore's Law. And as a result, we were able just last month to cut prices for Compute Engine by another 10%. By the way, that's still unmatched from anyone else in the industry. Today, we're doing more. We're actually lowering our prices even further on a wide variety of products. First, we are aligning our storage prices to the already low prices that we have on cloud storage. So BigQuery storage falls 23%. Persistent disk snapshots fall almost 80%. And we're making persistent disk SSD storage way more affordable, effectively cutting prices in half. Lastly, we've made a lot of improvements to our SQL service so that we're now able to offer you the large instances of SQL servers for 20%, 25% less. These price cuts are a direct result of continued technology innovation and Moore's Law. And we're passing those on to you today. But beyond just, just having compelling economics, we really wanted to show you the speed of innovation and development we are seeing also on the product side. Since March, we've launched over 100 externally visible features on top of all the continuous smaller improvements that we're doing throughout to all our products. Behind me, they're called out some highlights, and there's some that I'm particularly proud of. First, just since March, we acquired three amazing companies. Stackdriver has become the backbone of our world-class monitoring system that we're building for you, and we've continued to commit to supporting multi-cloud and stack driver across Google Cloud Platform and AWS. SyncRender offers rendering services, which is a part of our solution for the media and entertainment vertical. And finally, we are working really hard to make Google Cloud Platform the best possible cloud for application, mobile application development. And Firebase, is going to be the centerpiece of that mobile developer offering. And you will hear later from James from Firebase why they have decided to join us. He's going to be here up on stage in a bit. In June, we launched Kubernetes, an open source container scheduling and orchestration framework, which is based on all the tried and proven concept that we've learned over the last 10 years of running Google production services like Surge on top of containers. This project has intended to bring the community together and really help deliver an API to manage and run large amounts of containers in the cloud. In July, this movement has garnered a lot of support from companies like Microsoft and VMware and Mesosphere and many others. And we're already seeing thousands of commits from open source developers. And we're talking much more about this later today. We also introduced SSD-based persistent disks. These SSD-based disks provide a great combination of performance, availability, and durability, and make them the ideal backing store for databases and file systems and file servers. So with those, you're able to access your disk not just fast, but consistently fast. Let's say you're running a 500 gigabyte of volume, which is usually enough space for most databases, you're able to access 15,000 sustained IOPS whenever you need them. And finally, Cloud Debugger. We gave you a preview of that in, in I.O. in June. And given how like, impractical it is to attach a debugger to an instance running in production, I wonder how many of you have had to resort to adding diagnostic messages to your logs to understand the intermittent issues in one of your services in production. With Cloud Debugger, it makes it really easy to debug a distributed application. It provides you all the great debugging features that you're used to, but allows them to actually use those in production. So you can pick a line of code, you can set a watch point, and the debugger will return locals and a full stack trace whenever the next request hits that line of code anywhere, in any instance in production. 
and doesn't stop the service. So there's zero setup time, no complex configurations, and no performance impacts noticeable to your users. But whenever you hit that line, you get the information back that you were fishing for. It brings modern debugging expectations to the cloud. And this service is now publicly available in beta. So a lot of improvements on the product side, which is also accompanied by great momentum with partners and customers. The logos behind me are just seven of the partners that are here with us right outside. So when we're done here, I would encourage you to check out the partners that are in our partner launch outside. But there are also they're just seven drawn from many. We have uh, hundreds of technology partners who are providing tools that are integrated with Google Cloud Platform and extend its reach and functionality. And we also have hundreds more service partners that are providing implementation and consulting services to small, medium, and large companies around the world, helping them capture the value of Google Cloud. In addition to this, we're seeing incredible momentum with customers. Behind me are just some of the thousands of companies that use Google Cloud Platform to support their applications. These companies are coming to us because they know we are committed to the fastest pace of innovation, best price for performance, and because they want to benefit from the agility and ease of development that Google Cloud Platform provides. I'd like to introduce you to four of those companies today. Because they're using our Google Cloud Platform across the set of features that we offer. So Office Depot is the first one. It has long been a leader in e-commerce. The company launched its first website in 1997. And after its recent merger with Office Max, they're now a top five online retailer in North America. They selected Google Cloud Platform to create My Print Center, a new online experience to allow customers to order print shops, such as posters and business cards. The team leveraged App Engine and Google Cloud Storage to launch the cloud-based services both for, to online customers as well as to brick and mortar retail experiences. Customers can order print shops and then pick them up in any Office Depot store. Google Cloud Platform allowed Office Depot to reduce operational cost, improve development productivity, and reduce the time it took a customer to order and print that, execute that print shop by 40%. Sue Lilly, many of you might know that this is one of the premier shopping destinations for parents. It started just as a small online startup, retail startup, just four years ago, and is now a publicly traded company with over $1 billion in revenue. Sue Lilly brought the experience of window shopping to the web and focused on driving daily user engagement using data-driven marketing. Prior to coming to Google Cloud Platform, Sue Lilly had its data, its structured data, siloed in a SQL Server database, and its unstructured data in an on-premise Hadoop instance. Merging these two was a huge challenge. You couldn't join the data, and it really didn't scale with the number of users they had. So however, by bringing their data to Hadoop on Compute Engine and using Google BigQuery, they're now able to merge these data sets across and scale with their 4.1 million users while reducing cost. So Lily is now able to provide real-time insights, customization across all their data for all their customers using a single affordable platform. And Wix is a modern born on the web shop that helps over 55 million customers create their websites. Wix has a huge growth, and despite that growth, they needed to be very reliable. They needed to have close to 100% uptime serving the data, and of course, never lose user data. Wix discovered the ease of development, management, and scalability, and the speed of development with Google Cloud Platform, and decided to use it at a greater capacity. We now, they now serve their production media traffic from Compute Engine. They host their Wix editor on App Engine, and heavily use data store and cloud storage for their file, image, and metadata storage. All of this has allowed Wix to focus more on growing their business instead of managing the infrastructure. But why here just for me? Please welcome Kevin Bailey, the co-founder of Atomic Fiction, to the stage. Kevin.
thanks for the intro. Um, again, I'm Kevin Bailey. I'm the co-founder and a visual effects supervisor at Atomic Fiction. Now, Atomic Fiction is a visual effects company. We do big uh, visual effects for feature films and television. We have offices in Oakland, right here in the Bay Area, as well as a brand new office up in Montreal and another office in LA. So we're pretty much all over the place uh, in the continent. Um, we have uh, been really, really fortunate to work on great movies like Star Trek Into Darkness, uh, the latest Paranormal Activity films. Um, we even did a bunch of work on the television series Cosmos that was recently nominated for an Emmy for its effects. So we're really proud of the work that our team did on that. And we've been having a few little tech issues here in getting set up, but we're actually going to do a demo of how we do some of the visual effects work um, that, uh, that our teams are so busy on. Yay, it's working. So what you're seeing up here in front of you is uh, what a typical 3D scene uh, looks like when an artist is working on it. Now, it's a little bit uh, tough to actually see what this is going to look like at the end of the day, and that's because there is a really computationally intensive process called rendering that is what takes this gray shaded thing with the little orange square that you see back there behind it that's actually a, a virtual light. Um, there's virtual textures that are associated with it. It's basically just like a really light recipe, uh, if you will. And this recipe is turned into the final beautiful image that you see on a movie screen or a television screen by a process called rendering. Now, rendering can take anywhere between you know, five, 10 minutes to hours per frame to uh, actually complete. And that uh, has to happen 24 times for every second that is in a film. So you can imagine hours per frame, 24 seconds for every single second that's in a movie, it can just take for freaking ever um, if you have to do it on a small number of computers. Now, as part of Atomic Fiction's sort of like impetus, we, we actually used the cloud from day one. Um, not only did it just feel like the right thing to do, but we knew we couldn't afford to do it any other way. We couldn't afford to build our own giant data center. Um, and so as part of that, we had to actually develop some software to help control the cloud um, because the cloud to us is just a bunch of raw resources. So we created a tool called Conductor. And Conductor is the fruits of four years of trying to learn what the best way is to use the cloud. And this right here up on stage next to me is Greg. And Greg is the chief architect of Conductor. And he's actually going to show you a little bit about how uh, Conductor works. He's going to give you a demo. So we have this 3D scene. And uh, we'll launch a user interface that allows him to um, just enter some parameters. You know, what, how many frames he wants to render, which render passes. He's actually right now going to click a button. That's, he's only going to render one frame. This is a big spaceship from Cosmos. He's going to render one frame of this, but he's going to split it into 750 discrete little chunks. So there's going to be 750 instances, each of which are 16 cores, that are going to spin up. They're going to crank away on like a little teeny chunk of the image, and then it's going to be all assembled again at the end of the day. So he hits the Submit button. It goes to our custom tool, Conductor. Um, you'll see it, uh, that job actually uh, will uh, pick up at the, uh, the top of a list here. You see it there in Pending. And now all these instances are being brought up, and they're all going to just dive on it like a bunch of piranhas and, and finish it far faster than we would be able to otherwise. So while that's actually cranking away, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the background of myself and Atomic Fiction and kind of philosophically how we came to be and how we ended up on Google's cloud platform. <clears throat> so, growing up, uh, <laughs> I love movies. And my friend Ryan and I, who's my business partner now, we've known each other since we were seven, we love movies. And these kinds of movies, you know, we love the Back to the Futures. And Jurassic Park uh, was one of the things that really catapulted our passion into the industries. Now, we love these movies. We didn't love data centers. That's not why we got into this. And no offense to anybody in the crowd who is like a data center geek, but that just wasn't our thing. We wanted to be creative. And so we followed our passion. And through following our passion, we were lucky enough uh, to score a job with Lucasfilm straight out of high school at 18 years old. And we just ate it up, obviously. I mean, we never looked back. This was like the best thing uh, that could ever have happened to us. So since then, we've been at companies large and small um, and seen a lot of things go really well uh, in a lot of different ways. And we kind of distilled uh, two really important things that 
are a key part of making the visual effects process great, um, both economically and creatively. One is that you need to create an environment where artists can have fun and they can have creative ownership of the material that they're working on. They need to feel like they're part of the process and because they are artists, they're technicians too, but they're artists. The other thing that they need is big infrastructure to help them follow through on that vision. Uh, without that, they, they, you know, their ideas would be kind of stillborn, right? But the problem is it's very rare that you can have both of those things in the same company. You usually either have uh, like a big, big, um, uh, you usually have either a big infrastructure and kind of a cold cultural vibe, and or you have this very small shop uh, kind of family feel, but rarely do you have both. Um, so we are lucky enough to actually have both. And we use the cloud to give artists both of those things. So let me show you a little bit of what we do uh, with that uh, kind of uh, unique dichotomy that we have at Atomic Fiction. Thank you. Yeah, we obviously have a lot of fun doing what we do. Um, and actually, having fun is part of what we think is uh, really important in the process. Um, you know, it's part of ha creating that, that vibe um, of having that small shop. Um, and in fact, our kind of motto is we want to have a small shop vibe, big shop infrastructure. And again, the cloud is a really important part of that. And our first cloud setup that we used was actually really successful. We created a lot of great imagery with it. And through using it, we saw a lot of promise in the cloud. We knew we'd made the right decision. We also saw a lot of areas for improvement. And one of those areas was that, as is the case with a lot of cloud providers, we were being, being billed by the minute. And what that meant is, for example, if we had a 15-minute frame that uh, we were trying to render, when it was done, unless we had something else to go on to that instance, we had to pay for the remainder of that hour that we'd committed to. And since we want to spike up really high and then go down to zero in between when an artist doesn't have any work to do, we want to get stuff back to artists as fast as possible. It just it really forced us to take our workflow and tailor it to the cloud um, rather than the cloud supporting our workflow. And so we kept looking for better ways to do it and other cloud providers, and then we came across Google's offering. And uh, it offered something really different for us. And it, the, the per minute billing thing is actually makes a fundamental change in how we use the cloud. As you can see up here, the price difference when you go to per minute billing from per hour billing, everything else being equal, is pretty remarkable. This is for the cost for rendering a second of a typical uh, film. So as you can see, there's you know shorter time, shorter render times results in a bigger difference. But even in the longer frames where you're in the hours per frame, um, a 10% difference, that can make a big, big, big change um, across the board in a film where we're rendering thousands and thousands and thousands of frames. So the economics are pretty obvious. You know, per minute billing really, really helps us out, but it's not just the economic savings uh, that we see in here. It is, again, instead of us having to adapt to the cloud, the cloud adapts to us, it works the way that we want to work. And that means that artists get results back quicker and we're able to actually uh, enhance sort of their creativity through that. If they can get an idea that was just freshly in their head back in front of them, rendered in front of them, so instead of being that gray spaceship, it's the you know, full on thing sooner, then 
they can make changes and, and kind of like be more creative and free flowing with it, which is great. So speaking of that, let's go back to Greg's demo machine here. And uh, that frame should have finished. And by the way, what he was doing is he was actually setting up his own render farm with a click of a button, his own giant data center. He spun up 750 instances, that's 12,000 cores um, that cranked away on that frame of the spaceship. Um, and they can pull up uh, what that image actually looked like so you can see there's all the successful frames within Conductor. And so there's a spaceship. We would have been waiting for hours um, for that otherwise. And it, as you can see, it finished in mere minutes. Um, so it's a really, really big win for us to be able to get that kind of creative turnaround. Um, and by the way, we paid the same for that as if we'd put it on one machine and waited hours. So instead of hours and X number of dollars, it's minutes and the same number of dollars. So super, super excited about that. And that guy, that one guy, Greg is really freaking smart, by the way. Um, he, he did that, but he's only one guy, right? And he did that, you know, that entire process all on his own. So, uh, one of the other great things about this, by the way, is that not only is that frame done right now, but it's also instantaneously available to our Montreal team and our Oakland team. So it really, you know, thanks to Google's data replication, it really helps with cross-site interoperability. So we'll roll a quick clip here to show you what this uh, crazy spaceship looked like um, in the final shots in uh, Cosmos. So that's when uh, we got all those 24 frames per second all stitched together and uh, composited with nice lens flares. Of course, you need lens flares and everything. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it is, it's a really, really uh, amazing uh, sort of fundamental change in how we use computing uh, through Conductor. And we're actually really excited uh, to announce today that we uh, aren't just uh, going to keep Conductor to ourselves as happy as we are about it. We're actually going to be releasing it as a product um, in early 2015. So uh, you know, really for us, we're excited about what other visual effects companies are going to do with this, just like what we have. Um, but you know, Conductor and GCP are so uh, kind of flexible and open that we actually think Conductor is going to be very useful for other industries as well that have similar sort of multitask-based uh, computing needs. So thank you very, very much. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. Please welcome Brian Stevens, Vice President of Product Management. Good morning. So I'm, one, I'm a newbie again after many years. I'm one of the newest people to join Google's Cloud Platform team. Um, and my role is to help lead our direction you know, as we build our Cloud Platform products. Um, I love movies, but I love technology as well. And so for 25 years, I've been passionate about technology. And usually, that's landed me in the enterprise computing space, building products for you know, large customers. Um, and, but I don't ever remember over the course of that 25 years ever a day of being bored. You know, to be honest, I think that's because you know, over that course of time, I've always been really fortunate to land on working on some really interesting projects. You know, from X window systems you know, onto Unix, you know, clustering and high availability, distributed systems, Linux, open source virtualization, and then ultimately OpenStack. And, then, and I think the fortune continues because today I get to stand here and I get to work on the public cloud. Um, but I think, you know, all too often, you know, great technology projects, you know, are fun, but the best part about a technology project is when you can put it in the hands of users, right, and really just make some profound impact on what they're able to do. And I think too often, you know, business to business technologies can focus on technology for technology's sake. And I think that's one thing that consumer companies have really figured out. They really figured out how to focus on the user. You know, and at, at Google, I think we have the best of both worlds. Amazing technology and a focus on the user. So, you know, it's been eight weeks since I've been here, and I think it's a little bit like being a kid in a candy store, because I get from the inside to see all this great computer science that powers Google. And, and in some way, I think that's the mission of cloud platform, is to take that candy and bring it to you through these elegant APIs and user interfaces. Whether you're a developer working in a startup or you're an IT manager in a large company. So I don't really think that you know, this combination of world-class technology, fast innovation, and a focus on the user really exists anywhere else in the world today. 
So that's what really you know, got me excited about coming here, coming to Google, because it's not really about the state of what the cloud is today, but where we can bring it. You know, I think that the, you know, the generation one of the public cloud is, is fantastic, but it's largely been about moving a virtual machine into somebody else's data center. You know, today's cloud is largely really the externalization of, of the existing IT department and on-premise infrastructure, where you're still dealing largely with the same set of primitives and asking the same set of questions. You know, what size server do you need? How much memory should I have? How fast do, should it be? How many do you want? How much disk space? What flavor operating system do you want to use? You know, that said, in spite of the early state of cloud, it does deliver on some amazing benefits, right? Now you can actually provision whole systems with an API instead of a purchase order. You don't have to think about planning ahead of time all the resources that you're going to need as you scale, but yet they're readily there for you elastically, and you're only going to pay for what you use. You know, and it's all delivered on a cost model you know, that can't be matched internally, driven through the economics of the public cloud and the fact that it's multi-tenant, which really drives shared usage and better utilization. But the model still is largely the same. And IT departments really are bearing the big part of the burden of administering their IT assets in the sky. So you know, at Google, our vision for the cloud is a journey that goes beyond outsourcing hardware management. You know, we're going to invest in innovation, but that innovation is to actually allow our users to innovate. We want to be able to change what our users are able to do, not just where they're doing it. And we want to relieve developers and sysadmins of that operational burden because they're spending far too much of their time and dollars on administrative aspects. And we want to continuously deliver unparalleled price performance. You know, IT capability actually evolves you know, relatively slowly, but every now and then disruptions come along. You know, and once these disruptions are actually, you know, they're disrupted by name, but once they're actually taken advantage of and internalized, they can actually step function up the capability that IT has the performance they have, and often, often cost and efficiency. You know, over the years, the frequency of these disruptions are actually quickening. And when you look at just like the last 15 years alone, IT has moved through a series of them. You know, think back around 2000 with, with x86 and Linux and as it entered the enterprise. You know, prior to that, it was all proprietary Unix systems, which everybody thought were great, on, in, on you know, risk, expensive risk hardware. I remember you know, back in 2000, you know, working for Red Hat, working with some Wall Street banks, and they were seeing 200-fold you know, increases in performance just by moving to Linux, and those were the early days, not to mention you know, the cost improvement of Intel. And that, today, that platform back then is the platform that not only has changed enterprise, but it's also the platform on which we're building public cloud. And then as those x86 systems got a little bit bigger and single applications couldn't consume and utilize the whole system, you know, along comes virtualization you know, with VMware, Zen, and then ultimately KVM. And then in the last five years with public cloud. So just as we're getting our, you know, our heads around this public cloud thing, along comes the next disruption, containers. So when you think about it though, container technology is really conceptually very simple. You're taking an application and you're encapsulating it inside of a single file. And then you're taking the underlying operating system and you're, you're changing it. an operating system that in the past just ran processes. And we're retooling it so that now it can run these things called containers and run multiple containers simultaneously at the same time. So that's interesting technology. But the reason why it's gotten so popular is because even in its early state, it delivers really great benefits already for both developers and system administrators. You know, you think about what developers can do is they can now package their applications and all the dependencies that their application has into that single file. And so what that means is they now have reach for their application because they can deliver it across all these other platforms, variations in operating systems and public clouds without them having to worry about the nuances of each of those platforms and the configuration details. And it's very rapid. It's really easy to, to spin up and tear down a container. So it makes for a really quick development cycle for the developer. And when many applications aren't just a single instance and a single process server instance. Instead, many applications, when you think about it, have a back-end database store, they have a front-end web server, they have an app server tier where your business and app logic is, maybe a caching engine. 
So now, each of those service components that make up an application, they too can be packaged as containers, and then they can be distributed and ran across horizontal infrastructure. And because there's an API around all of this, it makes it really easy for developers to just plug in container technology into their CI system, so it makes it really quick to do testing. For system administrators, now installing an application is as simple as copying a single file under the system. And because of that portability, you know, most sysadmins aren't dealing with homogenous infrastructure. Even one version of an operating system they manage probably has multiple versions of major minor releases at different patch streams. And then in most all cases, you've got lots of operating systems inside. And then now they're bringing in public cloud. So this whole concept of sort of containerization of the application couldn't have come at a better time to help IT and sysadmins tame heterogeneous infrastructure. And because all the application dependencies now actually live inside of the container, they're actually able to run multiple containers and applications on a single operating system platform without those dependencies of one application conflicting with the other. And then through the API to container management, they are able to plug it into their provisioning infrastructure. So now they can provision really easily containers on the fly for their test systems or their prod environments. So Google's certainly no stranger to containers, right? Google's been based on containers for years long before the word container existed. And today, everything they do is spun up inside of a container. You know, two billion containers are started every week at Google. So it's an experience that has led to many contributions, including to the Linux kernel itself. In fact, it was about 2008 um, when Google contributed the C Groups project. And what that was about was that when a system's running multiple containers, it's really easy for them, the performance, to conflict with each other. So C Groups is really about how do you do a quality of service envelope in the Linux kernel around containers. And that was back in 2008. So cloud platform users are going to get to experience the benefits of a container-based architecture. In addition to being able to just spin up virtual machines, you're now going to be able to spin up whole clusters of virtual machines that are purpose-built for hosting containers. So, and then along comes this thing called Docker 18 months ago, right? And so quickly, you know, Docker has become really the de facto industry standard for that file representation of what that container looks like. And so what that means now is that any application or application service that's packaged as a Docker file can easily be deployed across this horizontal infrastructure in the cloud. You know, as consumers, we've long become accustomed that we can take out our mobile phone, we can search for that application, and we can install it in seconds. And now with this, with container technology, that same paradigm is coming to the cloud. So, as users of cloud platform, we get that you're probably not going to be managing 2 billion containers. But even managing 10, 100, or 1,000 can get complex pretty quickly. And it really doesn't have to, and it shouldn't be that way. The number of sysadmins that you have shouldn't grow proportionally to the number of things that they're actually managing. So what we've done is we've taken our internal experience around all the containers and running containers and orchestrating containers, and we created Kubernetes. And what Kubernetes is, it's, a, it's an API that makes managing a container environment dead simple. And so now with a single command, you can actually deploy a fleet of applications and all their services you know, across the cloud. We open sourced it, as Jörg was saying earlier this year, because in our opinion, the code and the API for, for technology you know, this critical, this important, shouldn't be held to just one company. So, but cloud is more than just compute, right? It's the convergence of compute, networking, and data into a globally accessible service increasingly accessed by mobile applications. So just as our experience in containers at scale is going to benefit the users of cloud platform, so too will our heritage in, in networking, data, and mobile. So here to take you through each of these four areas is my colleague, Greg. Thanks everyone for coming. I have got a lot of product announcements and product news to get through, so let's just dive in and get to it. You know, the adoption of public cloud has been amazing over the last few years. And we've seen companies, both large Fortune 500 companies and small two-person startups, 
get tremendous value out of the cloud. But as Brian said, we're at the beginning of an even bigger disruption, and we believe that containers are going to be essential to that disruption. So let's go through our product lineup and see how containers impact what we're doing. Well, those of you who know, uh, uh, know Google Cloud Platform know that our first product was App Engine, the original platform as a service. We looked at the, the, the state of creating highly scalable web apps and the difficulties that people were having building these applications, and we knew there was a better way. We knew that because over the years at Google, we had developed our own infrastructure to build highly scalable front ends. And since day one, App Engine has been using containers as an essential component of achieving very high scalability for, for the most demanding web applications. But you know there's a drawback to platform as a service, right? You got to color within the lines. You have to use the languages and the tools and the APIs that your particular platform as a service offers you. And the one thing that we knew talking to customers was that was a problem. And that's what we set out to solve with a product called Managed VMs. Managed VMs are built on Docker containers, and they let you use the language or operating system that you want within an App Engine application. So if you want to use an open source framework that we haven't integrated yet, or you want to tap into the range of machine types that Compute Engine supports, high memory, high CPU, different operating systems, you can do that via Docker containers and still have the auto management capabilities of App Engine available to you. So it really does combine both of those worlds. Managed VMs are now in beta. They're open for everyone to begin using, and I encourage you to check those out. The result is that App Engine is now more open because you can use any library, including open source frameworks. It's also more flexible because if you need to, you can run native C++ code, you can SSH into a particular machine if you want to see what's going on, so it's more flexible. And it's more powerful because you have the complete range of Compute Engine virtual machine types available. You can run one, four, eight, 16 core machines, different configurations of memory and CPU. And so really, we think that with managed VMs, App Engine becomes an even better product for people who are trying to build very highly scalable web front end applications. But as great as platform as a service is, and it is great because you get incredible productivity through a curated environment, let's be honest. There are times when you have an existing application that you're already running, and you want to start to get some advantages of the cloud, right? You want to get elasticity. You want to get better cost. And that's why we have Compute Engine. Compute Engine is our infrastructure as a service product that allows you to easily take existing systems and infrastructure, move them into the cloud, get ultimate flexibility and control because you can do whatever you want on the machine while still benefiting from Google's infrastructure, our network, our cost, features like live migration so that if we have to do maintenance on a piece of hardware that you're running on, we can migrate you off of that machine seamlessly without your application even missing a beat. Now, of course, a big part of Compute Engine, like any infrastructure as a service product, is having a, a robust set of operating system support that you can run on. And this has been important to us for, for quite some time, and we've been adding new operating systems um, as we went along. But if you look on that list, you'll see there's one Linux distro that's, notably, that's been notably missing. So we're very happy to announce that in partnership with Canonical, we're making it even easier to bring workloads <laughs> by having Ubuntu. We're also going to make it easy for you to take advantage of Canonical's Ubuntu Advantage program. So if you want to have a great support experience as well, you can do that as well through Cloud Platform. We couldn't be happier to welcome uh, Ubuntu uh, to the Google Cloud Platform, and that will be rolling out for you as well. Another addition that we're rolling out here is Compute Engine Auto Scaling. Now, Google has base, based a lot of our experience on building systems that scale. It's a little bit of our signature, right, that when you go to a Google application, we handle loads for their, lar their large or small. Auto Scaling builds on that experience, and it allows you to grow or shrink a fleet of virtual machines in response to the demand that you're seeing. You can do it based on any of a number of metrics, CPU load, query per second that you're currently seeing, or your own custom metrics if, if that's what you want to do. So with auto scaling, you have the ability to tailor your infrastructure to meet the actual load. Last, but certainly not least, I want to talk about storage of Compute Engine. We are adding local SSDs to Compute Engine. 
Now, we already had a range of network-based storage options for both magnetic and SSD for typical I.O. level needs. But you know, there are certain classes of apps that have super high I.O. requirements, whether that's something like a, a, a large SQL database or a Cassandra cluster. These applications can't make do with only 10, 15, 20,000 IOPS. They have much higher demands. And even though this is our first local SSD product, I think you'll see it leads the industry on both price and performance. So let's look at the details. First, they're available on any machine type. You don't have to pick a certain kind of machine. You can pick whatever memory or CPU you want, and then you can choose to attach between one and four 375 gig SSD partitions. So you can tune the needs to what you have. With four partitions, you get a staggering 680,000 read operations and 360,000 write operations. That's well above what any of the other public cloud providers are, are doing in terms of I.O. performance. It's also very competitively priced, 21.8 cents per gig per month. So again, you do the math, you can find out that this is a very attractive option if you're running Cassandra or other I.O. Intensive, IO intensive apps. And you still get all the other benefits of Compute Engine. We'll live migrate local SSDs in the event that we have to do a system migration. They're encrypted at rest automatically so you know the data is secure. So the combination of auto-scaling, Ubuntu, and local SSD means the Compute Engine is really ready to handle the most demanding IO-intensive applications out there. I encourage you to take a look at, the, at those products. So as great as infrastructure is, as Brian sort of hinted, we're still programming systems as individual servers. And we think the future is gonna look very different. And to see why, I'm gonna start by going back in time and look at a couple other disruptive technologies of the past. Now, most of us weren't around, certainly not doing uh, IT work in the day of the mainframe, so uh, bear with me here. But back in the 60s, the airlines operated reservation systems that were run by what were then state-of-the-art mainframes. And the way their reservation agents accessed them was by a dedicated terminal, a 3270 terminal. Then the, in the 80s, this revolution came on called the personal computer. And as we think about it now, it's obvious that the PC is revolutionary, right? You've got local disk, you've got graphics, you've got local compute, it has all this power. And so the airlines bought them. And what did they do with them? They ran 3270 emulator software on them. Now, now we, we chuckle at that, right? But the fact is, they treated them like the thing they already knew. They understood 3270 terminals. So the easiest thing to do was, at first, treat the PC just like a 3270 terminal. And there were some benefits, right? I mean, they got a choice of hardware providers. Uh, they got some cost advantages. But over time, developers started to realize that the PC was different and that there was a new application architecture to be taken advantage of. And that's when we saw the client-server revolution and the three-tier app revolution, and it really changed all of the way corporate IT was done. But that wasn't obvious at the beginning. The first step wasn't really to take advantage of all that. Let's look at a little bit more modern example, which is the smartphone revolution. You know, when the smartphones first came out, what did we all do? We ran a web browser on them, and we accessed the same web pages we always had. And that was amazing, right? I mean, having a web browser in your pocket was pretty, pretty astounding. But over time, we figured out that this was a new platform, and it had unique capabilities. And we started to switch to building custom applications that took advantage of GPS and all the capabilities. So pretty quickly, we figured out how, to, how that the smartphone was different than the web browsers that came before. So what's the pattern here between these two examples? I think the simple pattern is, is that when truly disruptive technologies come along, it's human nature that our first instinct is to treat it like the thing we already know. And I believe that's where we are with cloud today. It's clear that cloud has been an amazing disruption, but I suggest to you that if you're thinking of cloud today as simply a cheaper, faster, more flexible way of doing the same thing you were already doing, you're not getting all the value out of the cloud that you could. And there are many things about the cloud that's going to make it, that make it different. But based on our experience at Google, I think we could boil it down to one sentence, which is this. A data center is not a collection of computers. A data center is a computer. And when you start to think about not servers, but clusters that are just clusters of compute and, and RAM, 
and you let the system take care of taking your workloads and finding an available space in your cluster to run them, you can start to think about application development in a completely different way. And we think containers are gonna be the essential technology that makes that possible. I talked earlier about how we've been using containers at Google uh, as part of App Engine from the get-go. In fact, at Google, everything runs in a container. Literally, everything we run in our system runs inside a container. But what's exciting now is that this combination of technologies, of containers and Docker, are being opened up so companies everywhere can take advantage of them. You don't have to be Google's size and scale to start to take advantage of what containers have to offer. Now, as Brian mentioned, for those of you who aren't aware, containers are a lightweight way of isolating multiple systems running on the same, multiple applications running on the same Linux system. And it's based on technology called C groups that we contributed to the kernel a few years ago. Docker adds an incredibly powerful open source tools and package format. So it really allows you to package up your entire application into one format. It allows you to easily build applications using a repository of images that other people have created. The result is it's incredibly easy to build and deploy an application across multiple systems on your dev laptop that you're carrying here at the, the conference, at your private cloud that you're running on your premise, or in a public cloud of your choice. But containers are just the first step. And that's why we, were, we, we launched this open source project, Kubernetes. Kubernetes adds the ability to orchestrate containers. It allows you to define a logical cluster, and it takes care of scheduling your containers onto particular machines. And it's based on 10 years of experience we have at Google of building container scheduling systems. Now, we open source uh, Kubernetes under Apache because we knew that this technology was far too important for any one company to own or for it to, to not be done in an open source uh, fashion. I'm really pleased with both the number and the quality of partners who've stepped up to help be involved with Kubernetes. Microsoft, VMware, Red Hat, Mesosphere. I mean, these are all great companies with experience in doing distributed systems. And we also are all committed to this same vision of an open source portable container management system so that you can build an application and run it wherever you choose to run it. But we know there are people out there who want to use Kubernetes and use uh, containers, but who don't want to be involved in an open source project. They don't want to be building from GitHub themselves. They want a product that's integrated and easy to use along with the rest of their infrastructure. And that's why I'm very pleased to announce today a new product which we call Google Container Engine. Now, Google Container Engine is a fully hosted version of Kubernetes. It adds integration with our command line tools as well as our graphical user interface. It makes it easy for you to create a cluster of whatever size you want and then use Kubernetes and use Docker to begin to deploy images into those clusters. Now, this is an early release, it's an alpha. But based on the incredible feedback we've gotten on Kubernetes, we wanted to open this up to everyone immediately starting today. So please, we want you to try out Kubernetes. We want your feedback. We want your help in guiding and shaping this product as we move it forward. Now, those of you who have a mind to acronyms will probably notice that we have Container Engine and Compute Engine. And they both have GCE. And you're probably saying to yourself, what's up, guys? Well, internally, we tend to refer to Container Engine as GKE, and we do that both so we don't confuse ourselves, but also it's a little bit of a tip of the hat, if you will, to the fact that at its core, Container Engine is a hosted version of the open source Kubernetes project. But this is the kind of project that's much better seen than having me just talk about it. So to give you a demo of Container Engine, I've asked Brendan Burns, who's a tech lead on Kubernetes and the Container Engine project, to give us a demo. Brendan? Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about Kubernetes and Container Engine and how we're, we believe we're really making the Google Cloud Platform the best place to run containers in the public cloud. So what you'll see here is I have my Cloud Console open. So those of you who have projects have seen this before. And what you'll see if you go over to the Compute tab is we've added a new subheader over here. And that's where you'll be able to access Container Engine starting right now. So if I go over into Container Engine, I'm going to see an uh, opportunity to create a cluster. And as Greg said, what we're, really what we're really going for with this product, what we're really 
view as the future of computing is the ability to treat a cluster of VMs not as individual instances, but as a unified resource that you can schedule your applications onto. You don't really need to worry about the fact that there's individual machines, only know that those machines are essentially contributing CPU and memory to running your application. So let's go ahead and create a cluster. So I'll give it a name, GCP Live Demo. Scroll down. I can choose any of the Compute Engine zones. Let's put it in US Central 1A. That's an important feature because it means that your Container Engine cluster will run alongside any other VMs that you are running in the same network, accessible, that both the containers and other VMs are accessible to one another. And that means that if you are sort of beginning to transition to containers or just exploring containers, you can run parts of your application in a container system, parts of your application in a more traditional virtual environment. Maybe you put your web front ends in containers and you keep your database inside a traditional virtual machine, and they'll be able to see each other. And you can affect sort of a gradual transition from uh, technologies, previous technologies into containers. All right, so let's make the size of that. Let's maybe make a sort of smallish size cluster, 25 virtual machines, make those N1 standard fours. So what you'll see here is now, this is really where we're treating this as an aggregate resource. I've got 100 virtualized CPUs and 375 gigabytes of memory. That's all available to my application at any particular instance. All right, so we'll go down here, hit create. And the cluster is in the midst of setting up. Now it takes a couple minutes for the cluster to get fully initialized. So to demo the rest of it, I'm going to drop over to my terminal and use a cluster that I've already set up. Now just as a sort of, you know, there's nothing up my sleeves. Um, I'm going to show you I don't have any. There's nothing currently running on that cluster. One of the really great things about containers isn't just that it makes development easier, but you can actually take advantage of a library of images that other people have built and are curating for you. So the Docker image format has a large repository of other images. So I'm going to do sort of the hello world of distributed systems or cloud computing. I'm going to run WordPress. I'm going to install and run WordPress. So I'm going to go up over here to the Docker registry. Um, I have a WordPress image here. It has MySQL. Someone else uh, has packaged this up and maintains this image. And I can just take the image name, drop over to Container Engine, uh, the G Cloud tool here. And instead of listing, I will say create WordPress. Let's give it that image that I had before and the, any ports that I want to have open. I'm going to just open up port 80. All right. So it's going to go out, and it's going to ask Container Engine to schedule that job for me. Remember, we're treating this cluster as a collection of resources. The Container Engine itself is responsible for figuring out where to run. So it said host is unassigned. That's because it's in the midst of figuring out where to place it. And if I list my, po my, list my containers again, what you'll see is it's chosen node number 9 to place this application on. and there's the IP address. So let's copy the IP address, go back to the web browser, paste that in there. And we're in the midst of the WordPress setup. Now, I won't bore you with setting up the rest of WordPress. I'll leave that to some intrepid hacker who's copied down that IP address. So <laughs> you have about four minutes before I tear down this demo. All right, so let's drop back to the, let's drop back to the terminal. So another great aspect of you know, turning up images that other people have created, that's great. It's not all that different. It's a little bit faster, obviously, but it's not all that different than what you could do with a virtual machine image. Where containers really start to shine is where you're talking about doing development work. So running on my laptop here, I have Docker. So if I run a quick Docker PS, oh, we will see that Docker is not running. So this is what happens sometimes. Sorry. Maybe I will see if I can do this. There we go. Sorry about that. All right, and now I'm going to actually run this for you. So I'm going to I'm going to run. Uh, this is the place where you get to see fresh blood. Um, so I'm going to run one of those images that uh, is just like the. Uh, Eh, run. It would help if I actually gave it a command. So I'm going to run one of those images, in this case the Redis key value store, that is exactly one of those prepackaged images that is available. And now I'm going to also run my own code. So I'm going to grab that container and So 
I'm going to run that container as well. And now if I run that Docker PS, you'll see what you should have seen when I first ran that Docker PS. Um, and that's that I have one of these images that is prepackaged and my own code here running in this container. This is all running on my machine. And so when I go to localhost here, you'll see a simple guest book where I can insert messages like hello, oops, hello, GCP live, live. Hit submit, and the I would have hoped that the mess. Ah, I know what I did, but we'll skip over that. But the message, <laughs> I can fix it, but it'll take two minutes, and so you know, um, I'm tempted to do that, but in the interest of, of time, I'm going to not. But the the key value that comes out of this is that. I can actually take exactly that same code that is running on my laptop, and I can deploy it to Container Engine and know for certain that the code that should have worked on my laptop will actually work when it's running out on the cloud. So let's turn up the Redis cluster here, turn up Guestbook. All right, and so let's list out the containers that we have running now. And what you'll see here is that that same Redis image is running out in Container Engine, but you'll actually see that there's my code is running in a number of different places. So I have that front end running, I have this front end running, and this front end running, because of course when I deploy something out to the cloud environment, I, I want it to be redundant. I want it to be reliable. If any of those images fails or if any of those machines fail, I want to still have serving capacity. And indeed I have these IP addresses as well, and so if I grab the IP address of one of my front ends, I can go over here and run. And now we'll see. I'll zoom in on that so you can actually see what's going on. And I'll say, hello, GCP Live. I hope this works. <laughs> and we'll submit. And it works out in the cloud. So it shows you, indeed, that the cloud <laughs> the cloud, indeed, is more reliable than my laptop. Um, <laughs> all right. So, but to actually sort of demonstrate an additional power of Container Engine, I'm going to show you a little bit of a visualization of this. Let's hit reload. So just zoom back out a little bit so you can see. One of the things containers really enable, as Brian was saying, is the idea of a microservice. And so each set of containers that I'm running out there, the three front ends that are replicated for redundancy, um, are a microservice in and of themselves. And you can see here my front end microservice with three replicas. I have a Redis read slave um, with Let's hit reload. Ah. All right. Yes. All right, there we go. Sorry. I have a Redis read slave with two services running, um, and of course a Redis master with a single service running. Now at times what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to be able to resize the number of containers that are running. Perhaps you have an event, a demo, you have a, a launch that's coming up, and you're going to want to resize. And in this particular case, I'm going to resize the uh, Redis read slave. So I'm going to say resize Redis slave control. If I can sp four. All right, so what this has done is gone out to the container engine. It's actually asked and said, in place of these two slaves that I have running here, I'd like there to be four. So let's hit reload and see that. And indeed, there are now four Redis read slaves. And because we're using this microservice architecture, I haven't had to reconfigure my front ends at all. They simply go through the microservice load balancer and get load balance now out into four containers instead of two containers. Um, and so I'm really excited that we're bringing containers to the Google Cloud Platform. If you're interested in it more, there will be another session on compute later on this afternoon. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Greg. Thanks. So I think you'll sort of see why we're excited about the possibility of both containers and container engine. So what's this all mean for you as a compute developer? It really means you've got a range of options. If you are looking to build a highly scalable web front end and you don't want to have a back end developer at all, you can use App Engine, which has a proven ability to deliver that sort of capability. Do you have existing infrastructure and applications, and you just want to start immediately getting some cost advantages and some agility advantages, advantages without having to modify your existing systems? VMs and Compute Engine is a great place to get started. And if you're building new apps and you want to see what the future is going to look like for how containers and Kubernetes are going to drive the next generation of what really are going to be cloud-native applications, I encourage you to give Container Engine a try. So that's Compute. Let's turn uh, attention to networking. You know, you can't have a great cloud application without a great networking. 
And we've invested in network from the beginning at Google, whether that's in our data centers, whether that's fiber between our data centers, whether that's partnering with others for undersea cables to connect continents. But really, increasingly, network is not just about hardware. It's about the software-defined networking stack that you run on top of that. Back in April, we uh, told you about Andromeda, which is the latest, uh, of, latest version of Google's software-defined networking architecture. Well, over the last few weeks, we've been rolling out a new version of Andromeda, Andromeda 1.5, to deliver even better performance uh, for network-intensive applications. So let's take a look at just one performance benchmark uh, to see what Andromeda 1.5 means. This is a common benchmark. It's TCP throughput. And what you'll see is since the start of the year, we've had a 3x improvement in single stream TCP performance and a 5x improvement in 200 stream performance. So what this means is if you have applications that are, are network bandwidth intensive, Google Cloud Platform is an even better place to run those. But of course, in addition to being performant, you want a network to be cost effective. And Moore's Law doesn't end at the data center, it extends to the, to the network as well. So I'm happy to say that we've made optimizations in our network in the APAC region, and we've able to lower egress prices nearly 50% to countries like Japan and Taiwan. Now these are very fast growing markets, so this makes it even more cost effective for you to serve traffic into this very important part of the world. So you got a high performance network, you got a cost effective network. The next thing you usually ask is, okay, how do I connect my existing infrastructure into the Google Cloud platform. How do I make that connection? Well, today we're announcing Google Cloud Interconnect, a range of options that let a customer of any size, from small startup to Fortune 500, to easily connect their infrastructure to ours. So let me walk you through the options for Google Cloud Interconnect. The first is VPN connectivity. This allows you to create a secure IPsec-based tunnel and seamlessly have an encrypted connection between your infrastructure and ours. This will be available in alpha in a couple weeks, and it will go GA in the first quarter of next year. But we know there are customers that want a dedicated connection. They want a permanent, always-on connection. And that's why we have Carrier Interconnect. Carrier Interconnect allows you to work with a wide variety of partners across the world who will give you a dedicated, secure connection from your infrastructure into Google's. Finally, for those large customers that operate their own internet-connected network, we offer direct peering that allows you to simply peer your network directly to Google without having to go through any other intermediaries. And both of these options allow you to connect to any of the 70 points of presence that Google has around the world. This is locations like New York, San Francisco, Chicago, London, Paris, Tokyo, Taipei, and many more. This, by the way, compares with 13 uh, direct connect connection points for AWS and 11 for Azure. So if you're a global company, we offer you much, uh, many more ways to connect your infrastructure to ours. So no matter what you choose, you can get a secure, reliable connection between you and Google. So let's turn our attention to mobile now. You know, when you look at what's happening in developers and IT, it's no exaggeration to say that the two biggest things that are changing developers' lives is cloud and mobile. And in fact, it's the combination of those two that's really driving an even faster rate of disruption. Now, mobile itself isn't new to us. Uh, it's no surprise to us that some of our biggest initial customers were the mobile companies like Rovio and Snapchat, who saw the value in having somebody else be able to scale their backend infrastructure. It's one thing to scale to half a million requests per second if you're just scaling your, your web layer. But to scale the web layer and the caching layer and the database layer, um, all to handle hundreds of millions of simultaneous users is really hard. That's why we see companies like Snapchat and Rovio using the cloud platform. It's why we see enterprises like Motorola use BigQuery to handle and, and make sense out of all the millions of log files that they deal with from mobile devices. Earlier this year, we announced the acquisition of Apurify, a mobile testing company. And we've seen customers like Macy's use that to test and verify their mobile applications. There's nothing worse than pushing an app up to an app store, wait two weeks for it to show up, and then discover you've got a bug, and then how long does it take for you to actually get an updated version of the app pushed through the app store? Apurify lets you actually know before you do that that the application works. And of course, all these come uh, as part of the larger set of investments Google is making around mobile. Developer products like App Engine and Compute Engine, 
hundreds of APIs that we offer for things like YouTube and Maps. All of these are designed so that you as a mobile developer can focus on the things that make your app special and not on just the common boring parts that are common to everybody else. And when we look forward, what we see is the real next challenge is how you seamlessly make cloud and mobile work together. That's particularly important in a world today where most of your customers don't just have one device, they have two. They might have a tablet and a phone and a laptop. And the most popular mobile apps today aren't islands. They're built around a multi-device, social, real-time experience. But if you've ever tried to make data reliably sync between a phone, a cloud, and another phone or a tablet without killing the battery, you know that's a really hard problem. And it's even harder when you realize that much of the world doesn't have a 3G or an LTE connectivity. Most of the world is connected over a 2G or slower internet connection. So what do you do? How do you build applications that actually seamlessly connect devices and cloud without driving you crazy as a developer? Well, that's part of the reason I was just so happy when the team from Firebase joined Google Cloud Platform. Firebase is used by companies like CBS, Citrix, Instacart, Nest, to deliver real-time mobile and web experiences. And they're also a great fit for Google. Like us, they are passionate about developers and making great developer experiences. Like us, they believe in a multi-device world where people are gonna be using devices from many different vendors. Like us, they love open source and they believe that open source is critical to how you build and develop uh, communities. So we think the combination of Google's incredible elasticity and scalability on the back end with Firebase's incredible ease of use for developers will really deliver an amazing experience for customers. But again, this is something else where talking to slides isn't nearly as interesting as seeing it in real life. So I'm very happy to have James Tamplin, co-founder of Firebase, who's gonna come on stage and give us a demo. James? Thanks, guys. Hi everyone, I'm James Tamplin, co-founder and CEO of Firebase. Firebase is the real-time app platform. We give you the common infrastructure you need to quickly build great mobile and web products without needing to spin up a server or write server code. Two weeks ago, we made a pretty big announcement, and that is Firebase is joining Google. We're thrilled to be here, and I'm excited to be here with all of you today at GCP Live. But what I'm most looking forward to is the future. Firebase and Google Cloud Platform are building the best developer platform in the world. First, I want to tell you a little bit about why we started Firebase. So I'm going to begin with the obligatory garage photo. This is my co-founder, Andrew, and I. We met in high school, and we built three products prior to Firebase. Every single one necessitated features that let our users collaborate in real time. Now, there were no great tools or libraries to help us at the time, so we spent months building the underlying technology, and I don't want to count how many hours we spent debugging race conditions. This process made us realize just how ubiquitous real time was going to become and how painful it was to build. A light bulb went off, and we founded Firebase to help developers like you create great mobile and web real-time experiences without having to worry about the underlying complexities of a distributed real-time system and without having to spend hours of your life debugging race conditions. So that's a little bit about why we started Firebase. Let's talk about the product. At the core of our platform, Firebase has a NoSQL JSON database. It stores your application data in the cloud, and changes to that data are synchronized between devices in milliseconds. As Greg mentioned earlier, this is fantastic for building those real-time experiences that users have come to expect. Now, the main benefit of Firebase is rapid application development. All you need to do is write the code, the front-end code that runs on the device, and we take care of the rest. This makes applications that used to take months now take a fraction of that time. Now, this programming paradigm is also fantastic for mobile. Since you have a local cache of the data on your device, Firebase apps remain responsive, even when the network connection is slow or unreliable. 
You can use Firebase through our iOS, Android, and JavaScript real-time clients, and you can also use it through our REST API. But instead of telling you, let's go over to the podium together and let's build an application. Uh, so we're going to build the hello world of, of real-time apps, and that's a chat application. Uh, the first thing I need to do here is I need to create a UI, a GUI, sorry. Um, and so I've got it here on the left. As you can see, my screen on the, my editor here on the, the right, I've just got some HTML, uh, just some vanilla HTML. I'm including some CSS. Uh, so I can type my name in here. I can type James, and I can type a message, hello. And when I press the Enter key, nothing actually happens. So let's jump over to our editor, and let's write some application logic to bring this to life. So the first thing I need to do when writing a Firebase app is I need to create a reference. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm saying var my ref equals new Firebase, and I'm passing it a URL. Now, you can think of a reference like a pointer to a location in Firebase. That location is that URL, and I can then call methods on that reference to manipulate data. So the first thing we want to do with our application is we want to make it so that when I press the Enter key, we save the message to Firebase. Uh, so I've got some code here. It's just some vanilla jQuery that detects when I press the Enter key. Uh, it pulls the values from the username and message field. And then I'm going to call myRef.push. I'm going to construct a JSON object. I'm going to say name, username, and then text, message. And now when I jump over to the right, we're going to refresh the page. I'm going to type James hello. And the message disappears. And that's exactly what line 9 is doing. It's clearing the field once the enter key is pressed. Let's see where that message went. You remember how each reference has a URL? Well, I can just punch that URL into a browser, and I can see the data inside my Firebase. So I've got one message, James hello. Cool. So let's go back to our editor, and let's finish the application. We now need to render chat history and render new messages. And I can do that by attaching a callback to the reference. So we're going to say on. The type of the callback is child added. And whenever a new piece of data is added to the underneath that reference, um, we're going to fire the callback. And it'll also fire once for each, uh, each, each existing piece of data. Um, so I've got, again, some vanilla jQuery that just takes that data and renders it. So now when I refresh the page, I should see that hello message come in. Awesome. And when I type a new message, I've got my Firebase up on the right-hand side there. It's going to appear in the chat and in my Firebase. And just so you know I'm not lying to you, uh, I've got uh, Firefox up here. And Greg is going to say, this is so cool. And there you have it, a fully working chat application in just a couple of minutes on Firebase. So that's an example of uh, a pretty simple application. Uh, why don't we show you a little more complex one now? Uh, so we're moving to the Google San Francisco office next week. And we use this as inspiration to build in a tech executive move of 5,000. Uh, and you, you may be asking, what's in a tech executive move of 5,000? Well, it's the latest, the greatest local, mobile, social, cloud-based office asset visualizer. Uh, in, in English, we just built an app to help us with the floor plan. Uh, so we built three versions of it. I've got one on my laptop here. I've got an iPad, which I'm going to give to Greg. Thank you. And then we have an, office me uh, excuse me, an audience member here with an Android tablet, if you could hold that up. Uh, so this is all backed with Firebase. And if I move assets on the screen, uh, they're going to be reflected uh, to every device in real time. So I've got my ping pong table here. Uh, we've got a ball pit. We've got some desks. Uh, now, real estate prices are pretty high in San Francisco, and we're running out of space. So uh, Greg, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to put you in the bathroom. Wait, wait, wait. Urz is in Dublin. Let's put him in there until he gets back. OK. Well, we'll give him the red stapler as well. There we go. Uh, I had a good two-week run at Google. <laughs> um, so again, this is all just front-end code, uh, just running on the devices, no server-side code at all, uh, completely cross-platform. Uh, so Greg, thank you so much for your help. Thank you so much, audience member. Uh, really I'm going to go plan it. my next office location. <laughs> cool.
Cool. So we can go back to, back to the deck now. Uh, by the way, if you would like to see in a tech executive mover 5000 built right in front of your eyes, you can go to our 1 p.m. session. My co-founder, Andrew, will be building it uh, back to front to show you all the features of Firebase. Uh, now, there are a few features I didn't actually mention in the demos. Uh, so they're user management, security rules, and hosting. Our user management system lets you do login with Google, Facebook, Twitter, and GitHub without having to fight with OAuth. Uh, and you can also easily hook it into your existing user account system. It's just as easy with Firebase to build features for your existing app as it is to build a brand new application. Our security system is one of the most flexible out there. We let you create expressions that look like JavaScript and attach them to pieces of data. You store those with us, and when, then date, when data is then read or written, we, we execute them and then uh, either allow or deny the command. Uh, this lets you put all of your security in one place and lets us maintain the real-time guarantees Firebase is known for. And finally is hosting. We have a production-grade hosting service for the developers that lets you easily put your assets online with just one command line. It's backed by a CDN, and we take care of all the SSL provisioning for you. Now, we've seen some tremendous growth in the last 14 months since Firebase launched in general availability. We're now used by more than 117,000 developers, and more than 1 million devices are sending data through Firebase at any given time. We're used by organizations from small startups through large corporations. These are some of the folks that are using Firebase to power their products. With Google's backing and resources, we're so excited to make Firebase better for all of our developers. And speaking of which, I'm excited here today to announce a brand new Firebase feature. This is something that our community has been champing at the bit for, and we've spent months and months of hard work building. And that feature is richer querying capability in Firebase. This means that developers can now sort Firebase data by any arbitrary field. Query results and changes to standing queries are returned in milliseconds, again, maintaining the real time that Firebase is known for. It's available today in production on our iOS, Android, JavaScript, and REST APIs. So what's next? Well, coming next is a feature called Triggers. With Triggers, you can define webhooks that are sent to external APIs when data inside Firebase changes. This makes it significantly easier to build features like charging a credit card, sending an SMS, or kicking off an app engine process. The other thing that's coming is deeper integration with Google Cloud Platform. We're excited as our applications grow in complexity that they can leverage uh, products like BigQuery and App Engine. The future looks pretty bright. With Firebase and Google Cloud Platform, we can now take developers from the earliest stages of development right through a large, complex, successful application. Thank you so much for your time today, and we're excited to be a part of Google. I hope that demo gave you a sense about why I'm so excited about Firebase joining Google Cloud Platform. You know, when you look at everything that, that we just walk you through, I think you can see how we're trying to innovate at every piece of the cloud platform stack, from compute, from network, to mobile, to economics. And it's all there because we want to make it easier for you to build the next great application, whether you're at a large company or a small, whether you're just getting started, or whether you've been around for decades. So with that, I'd like to switch the subject to big data. And I want to bring up Francis, who's the tech lead for our big data team, to walk you through how we're going to apply that same sort of transformation to the world of big data as well. Francis? Information is being generated at an incredible rate. Right? Applications are generating logs data. Devices are constantly reporting back usage patterns. Websites are tracking user engagement. Now, there's valuable insights in all this data, but unlocking them can be cumbersome and costly, even for experts. We want to change that at Google. We want to help you efficiently and effortlessly get insights from your big data. 
And the first part of that is by giving you access to the same awesome tools that make our engineers productive internally. Cloud PubSub is a large-scale, reliable, many-to-many -many event delivery system. It's a managed service. That means there's no infrastructure that you have to deploy, scale, or manage. This type of event handling is a core part of many applications, both for ingesting information and organizing process flow. It's particularly useful for big data applications because their ingestion can be challenging and unreliable. We've recently added the ability to post several messages at the same time into Cloud PubSub. We've also increased the rate limit to 10,000 QPS. So that means that you can ingest hundreds of thousands of events per second. Now, to get started with Cloud PubSub, you simply define a topic, set the access permissions, and start publishing events. As soon as we've received a message, you can rely on it being safely delivered to the various subscribers. Each of these subscribers can use filters to enable finer grain delivery. Another, option, another offering is Cloud Dataflow. Now, Dataflow is a fully managed service for data processing pipelines. It's based on the next generation of MapReduce. This, Dataflow uses the same programming abstractions for both batch and streaming use cases. And this means that you can focus on your application logic without worrying about the intricacies of the particular processing mode. I've spent the last six years building the infrastructure behind Dataflow and using it to change the way our internal developers process data. So I'm absolutely thrilled by the opportunity to share this publicly. Dataflow is currently getting great feedback from our early access customers, and the team's working really hard to make it more broadly available soon. Now, of course, the easiest place to extract insights from large-scale data sets remains BigQuery. BigQuery provides a simple and familiar model that lets analysts explore their data by writing ad hoc queries in SQL, using either the API or the web interface. There's no operational overhead, so you just load your data by importing files or continuously streaming in events. The data is immediately available for querying. Now, the best way to illustrate the power of BigQuery is going to be to use an example. All right. So here I am at the BigQuery web UI. So I'm working here with the HTTP archive data set. Now, this is a public data set that contains a snapshot of the most popular websites and the resources that they request. It currently has around 57 million resource requests for 600,000 sites. This data has been gathered every two weeks for about the last four years. So in total, this data set's only 1.4 terabytes of data, and that's pretty small by our standards, but definitely large enough to prove a challenge for many people. So let's dive into this data set and investigate the popularity of some JavaScript frameworks over time. So I'm going to compose a query and go ahead and paste it in there. So you can see this query is doing a few things. It's doing some regular expression matching on the names of some common frameworks. It's doing some aggregation. The syntax highlighting here makes it easy to see what I'm doing. There's also this syntax validator. So you can see if I make a syntax mistake, BigQuery is going to quickly warn me this isn't a valid query. I'm also going to go into the options here and just turn off the cached results to make sure that when I run this, you're really seeing the raw speed of BigQuery. So as I run this query, it, BigQuery is going through 1.6 billion rows. Now, it's going through that entire data set, but, you, but figuring out which parts and which columns of the data it actually needs to access. So in the end, it's only going to process 178 gigabytes of data. And that will save you both time and money. So this query just ran in 8.8 .8 seconds. Right? This is crazy fast for data this large. Speed like this is going to fundamentally change the way that you interact with your data. So down here at the bottom, I've got my results as a table. I've got the count per framework per month. And I can start paging through this. But finding the trends here is going to be pretty difficult. We have a number of uh, partners at Cloud Platform, including Click and Tableau, that make it much easier to uh, analyze your data in BigQuery. So let's pop over to Tableau and see what we can do. So here's a Tableau worksheet connected directly to BigQuery, running a query very similar to the one I just showed you. So I've got the absolute values of resource requests at the top and uh, relative values at the bottom, and I've got them categorized by the JavaScript framework. So clearly, most resource requests are not to a JavaScript framework. These are going to be images and so on. So if I want to dive into JavaScript, I'll deselect those. 
Now I can see just the frameworks, but still the results here are dominated by a couple of the most popular frameworks. So maybe I want to dig a little deeper. I can deselect some more. And now I'm able to see things like the growth of Angular over time, right? Perhaps I want to filter by a specific domain. So I'll go and filter this to Google. At this point, this is actually generating an entirely new query, connecting to BigQuery, reprocessing all 1.6 billion rows, and getting me back the results. So this, this feel here, at the speed at which I'm able to get results, makes it feel like I'm really working with my data, right? It's very interactive. So once you've played around with BigQuery and seen how, these, how much fun this is over the public data sets, you're going to want to import your own data, right? And when you're not actively querying your data, you're paying just a low storage rate. After the 23% reduction announced this morning, that works out to two cents per gig per month. And that's right in line with the costs of cloud storage. So as well as our native big data tools, like PubSub, Dataflow, and, I, and uh, BigQuery, we want you to be able to use the many great tools in the Hadoop ecosystem. Making these tools run well at Google is easy for us because of the underlying infrastructure, the compute, networking, and storage of Google Cloud Platform. So we started by automating cluster deployment so you can get started running a Hadoop cluster quickly. We also want Hadoop to be fully integrated into the Cloud Platform. We don't want your data to be siloed. So we've created connectors to make sure that all processing tools, whether native or open source, and all storage services can collaborate. My colleague Paul is going to demo some of these in his afternoon session on analytics. So as you've seen, with Cloud Platform, we give you the tools, both native and open source, to, get, to quickly and efficiently get the actionable insights you need from your big data. Thank you. So hopefully the last 90 minutes gave you a little bit of a window into just how fast we're resetting the definition of what the public cloud should be. You know, before, even before I came to Google, I knew that Google was an innovation company from search, Google Glass, you know, Hadoop, self-driving cars. But in cloud, we get that our innovation is for one purpose, to build a great cloud platform so that our users can innovate. <clears throat> Behind me, you see just some of the areas we talked about today that's a step along the way on that journey. We're going to do everything we can to unburden you so that you can shift your time and your money away from acquiring, deploying, managing, and fixing infrastructure and focus back on your own business. We'll also deliver a reliable platform that you can depend on, you know, one that you don't need to work around and, and certainly one that doesn't keep you up at night. And we'll continue to drive great efficiencies and pass that cost savings on to you. you know, we'll do the expected, we'll do the unexpected as well and the name of insp both inspiring and funding your next innovation. We want to make it easier for people to kick the tires for, for cloud platform. So we made a $300 credit available <clears throat> for new users of cloud platform. And that can be applied against anything, whether it's App Engine, Compute Engine, BigQuery, or even today's Container Engine. So today, we've got a, a great day planned for you. Um, downstairs, we have a partner lounge. And so we encourage you to go down and, and check out the partners and see the technology that they've built, both on top of the cloud and then integrating with the cloud. Um, also, stop by Cloud Tech Stop, and that's staffed by both support and solutions engineers. And they can sort of dive deep in your application or even show you some of the things in the click to deploy solutions. If you want to meet the Firebase team, they've got a, a podium set up down, by, down in the atrium. And then for everyone, either here or on the live stream, we've got two tracks set up. The first is on hot topics in the cloud. We'll cover things like more on containers, if you had enough already, um, real-time mobile apps, um, areas around security and privacy, as well as some of the new cloud debugging tools. The other track is really developer-oriented on how to you know, um, design, develop, you know, deploy, and analyze your application. Um, so that, that track is really a, a, a strong technical introduction to Cloud Platform. So I want to thank everybody for, for sharing the day with us, and I really hope it's a great one. <laughs>